it's Lee from ColouringQueen.net and I hope you're having a good day today. Today I am going to colour for my Joanna January 2022 colour along and what I decided to colour was something pretty easy. I thought that I would colour from Joanna's free digital download colouring book which is called Flourish. You can get it on her website. And I printed out this little picture of the birdies on Express Blending Card and I just did that at Officeworks for 10 cents. So much easier than using my printers and getting them all down on the table. It's just so much cheaper. I just bring the blending card there and they print it out for me. And I'm using the blending card because for a big change, I'm going to colour with markers today. So I'm going to use a mix of my Copics and maybe some Sharpies. We'll see how it goes. And I'll probably add some Prismacolors at the end, but we'll see how it all goes. I won't be colouring all the birdies. I think I'll be lucky to get one birdie done, <laughs> but we'll see how it goes. It's also colour and story time day. So today's story, I'm going to actually tell you two stories and they're both medical. Now the first story is a personal one for me and it may be TMI and to be honest it's a little bit gross. So you might want to skip ahead to the real story <laughs> that I'll be telling you. So the first story <clears throat> is where I have been for the last couple of weeks. Uh, I posted on my community tab I think two weeks ago that I was having a little bit of time off to enjoy the sunshine here in Australia. The sunshine didn't actually last very long before it started raining like mad again and being very humid and overcast and I really never got into the pool, just my feet wet. And on the, I think on the Saturday, about two weeks ago, I thought I would nip out and mow the lawn. We've got so much of it. And I'm mowing away and, uh, you know, I felt this pain on my right breast. And I thought it was actually the wire from my bra and the way I was mowing the lawn because I've still got this awful mitten on my hand. Still got the tendon problems, which I've made uh, worse over the last couple of days. And um, so I thought my wire was pushing into my breast and causing this pain. So I decided that I would take the bra off and I would throw it in the bin because clearly it was no good anymore. <laughs> and uh, so I threw it in the bin and uh, I didn't put another one on and I just sort of let it go and... Uh, the next day this mark on my breast became like a five cent piece and I'd been feeling nauseous the night before and I actually couldn't eat dinner and I'd gone to bed and so having this five cent piece mark on my breast I pulled the bra out of the bin and I realized that the wire wasn't broken and there was no reason why the bra should have been causing this pain to my breast so you know looking at the mark I thought maybe I've gotten bitten by a spider and I'd been working in the garden and you know deadheading flowers and you know it is Australia after all we have a lot of spiders and so the mark kept expanding expanding and in the end my whole breast basically was this bright red mark and really really painful so painful that I couldn't actually wear a bra so I thought even for me everyone knows that I have medical anxiety but it was just getting too too sore for me so I made an appointment to see the doctor and uh, that was on Monday but I couldn't get in until Wednesday and so by Wednesday this mark on my breast had just expanded it was incredibly painful I couldn't touch it it was just so sore it was unbelievable and so I was expecting the doctor to tell me that I've been bitten by a spider and you know here's some cream and off you go but that's not what happened <laughs> apparently I had an abscess on my breast and it was incredibly painful and so she said to me I think you need to go to hospital and have surgery so of course uh, if you know me you know I don't do hospitals I 
don't even like to visit people in hospital and I personally haven't been in a hospital since I was 15 and I have anxiety about anything with needles and I have been getting better because I've had the double jab and I've had that dental surgery and I really feel like I'm turning you know or well, at least getting better for me with needles in the skin but as far as facing anything under anesthetic or whatnot that's just like mind-blowingly frightening for me and I cannot tell you what thoughts were running into my head when she said I had to have surgery and they were not good thoughts <laughs> and so anyway um, she knows who she's dealing with <laughs> and so she said look you know let me um, you know drain it and so we went into her treatment room and she again said, I really think you need to go to hospital. Um, you know, it's really too severe. And she's, you know, drawing all these purple marks on my breast and assigning it. I felt like I was in some sort of really weird doodle contest, <laughs> you know, but it was so incredibly painful. And so um, anyway, she uh, cut open the old boob and the poor little girl was in agony and five needles and I felt every single one of them let me tell you it was excruciatingly painful and because of my needle anxiety I had to have a nurse uh, you know next to me to distract me and they had a teddy bear that they brought in so I could squeeze the living life out of that poor stuffed toy so anyway um that was just incredibly painful put me onto a shed load of antibiotics and because I'm allergic to the wonder drug of penicillin I have to take you know extra of antibiotics but anyway I felt like you know I'd been extremely brave <laughs> and um, and for me you know I was pretty happy with myself because I'd managed to have this like um, day surgery type thing and with my huge anxiety so I felt pretty happy about it I had to go in the next day and uh, so when she checked it they have a marker that they put around it to see if it's expanding or not and if it's growing and I pretty well felt that it it had actually um, been seeping throughout the day so I felt like she was going to tell me I could go home and everything would be fine and just take the antibiotics but of course she didn't say it that way <laughs> and she pretty well said you know that I'll have to go to hospital and uh but she did allow me you know until the next day because I'd only been on the antibiotics I'd only had like three or four tablets because uh by the time I'd got them from the chemist etc the day before so anyway the the next day I um I rock up to the doctor expecting that I'll be told that I'm getting better and you know no big drama so it, of course <laughs> That wasn't the case and it was go to uh, emergency at the hospital and I cannot tell you how freaked out I was because again you know I have this huge anxiety and I know it's no big deal for no one for everyone you know I know most people can go to the doctors or anything but I can't even have a blood pressure cuff on without taking it off and you know freaking out so this was massive for me. I had to call David and he had to come home from work to take me to emergency in the hospital. And so, you know, I get, got there at uh, Prince Charles Hospital in Chermside. And let me tell you, the healthcare system here in Queensland is just fantastic. I I really can't commend them enough, um, ex you know, especially with dealing with anxious patients like me you know, because I was beside myself. <laughs> I really was. And, uh, you know, they allowed David to come in despite all the COVID things because of my high anxiety. And anyway, the surgeon, uh, he wanted to operate on me in theatre, which of course freaked me out. And he was such a kind and, uh, you know, really great surgeon, uh, really excellent advice. The treatment there was just, you know, fantastic. But as I explained to them, you know, while I was trying to crawl out of the bed and make my escape out of the hospital because it was hard enough for me to go into the hospital, but as soon as I got in there, I was trying to get out of there. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, 
really trying <laughs> to get out of there. And the registrar, luckily, he sort of agreed with me that um, I'd only given the antibiotics two days worth. And because of my high anxiety, you know, operating on me or um, putting me in um, overnight with an IV in um, was like really freaking me out. And, you know, they agreed to uh, let me go home eventually after I'd had an ultrasound and promised that I would come back, uh, you know, if it got worse. So that's where we ended up on Friday night, late there, nine o'clock at night. By the time that I'd managed my escape out of there, I was already dressed and ready to go <laughs> um, because I just couldn't stand the thought of having something in my vein. Uh, I've gotten so much better with getting a needle in the skin, but the thought in my vein just really freaked me out. And I am considering myself really luckily, lucky. Um, I feel like I've had a lucky escape because I've been able to take the antibiotics and it has gone down and I'm going to the doctor every day to get it attended to and uh, follow up and all the markings and stuff have gone down. But you know, this time I might have got away without having that needle in my vein, but, you know, next time I might not be so lucky, so I've really got to try and work on this anxiety and get to the next level where I can actually take them doing that because they were very reluctant to let me out and the surgeon wanted to operate and it just freaked me out so much. The fear just overwhelmed all my logic. And I really am a logical person, except when it comes to anything medical, I just freak out. And um, I, I am actually getting a little bit better. I think I'm getting a bit better, but, uh, you know, not to where I want to be at the moment. But anyway, uh, the bottom line is my doctor thinks that I have diabetes, but of course, you know, I, I'm not willing to have that you know blood test so what I've done is just change the diet and cut out all the sugar and uh, we're going to go with a urine test after we uh, finish up the treatment of this but I really wouldn't wish this on anyone it is so incredibly painful and every time I touch the desk or do anything with these little double d puppies um, it just hurts so much but it's unbelievable but the medical professionals up here, as opposed to Sydney, where we used to live, I'd still be in the waiting room. Um, these guys are just amazing and so good at their job and so caring and really thorough. I just can't speak highly enough about them. They were just excellent. And my doctor, who was actually on holidays actually rang me twice on her holidays to see how I was like that's just unbelievable I've never had a doctor ring me my dentist rang me uh, the day after that dental surgery that I had but I've never had a GP ring me so I just couldn't believe that I thought she must have the wrong number <laughs> uh, for the last uh, week or two weeks I've actually not been enjoying the sun of Queensland. I've actually been, you know, really quite sick. The antibiotics they give me and the dosage of it, they tend to knock me out a bit and I end up sort of sleeping four or five times a day and uh, I get a lot of side effects from them and because there's such a high dosage of them. But, uh, you know, it's it's sort of worked out this this time for me that I've been able to take the tablets and get rid of this infection but I know that it might not be the next time or there might be something else and so I've really got to work on this fear and anxiety that I have and uh, you know I'm seeing the doctors every day and obviously I'm getting better so because I am able to record but that's where I have been and I really wouldn't wish this on anybody I really wouldn't it's just so painful and of course trying to escape from a hospital bed when you've got your your left hand with tendon damage and your right breast <laughs> with a massive infection it's not easy trying to make that getaway but you know, I gave it a good go. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm going to work on that and I uh, started this uh, type 2 diabetes diet. You know, it was a real wake up call about how anxiety can rule your life and how the, you know, the fear is just so overwhelming. It's 
just unbelievable, but I really am working on it and uh, trying all sorts of desensitization techniques and whatnot. You know, so hopefully I'll get there sooner rather than later. So that was my TMI. And uh, I hope you're not too bored hearing about my poor little right breast. So uh, (laughs) on to today's story. And just like the doctors at Prince Charles Hospital warned me of uh, if I should leave and not have uh, 24 hours of IV drip on me or have surgery that there was a risk of blood poisoning and you know all other sorts of nasty things failure to warn uh, people in relation to surgery is now a huge thing and it's a big area of medical negligence so I want to tell you a story about a lady called Marie Whitaker so Marie Whitaker's childhood took a bit of a tragic turn when she lost the majority of her sight in her right eye um, as a result of an injury to it when she was just nine years old. Now the injury is described as a penetrating injury so it sounds like something was poked in there and that's what damaged her eye. But luckily Marie was made of strong stuff and she was able to overcome this injury and go on and lead a pretty normal life, making the most of the sight in her left eye, her good eye as she referred to it as. And she ended up uh, completing her education, she got a job, she got married and she had children. But from 1980 to 1983 she left work. Uh, Her son had been injured and she took some time off work to care for him. And during this period uh, in 1983 she decided to have an eye examination before she returned back to the workforce. So she wanted to get all her ducks in a row before she went back to full-on work. And she went to her local general practitioner, her local doctor, who referred her to an ophthalmic surgeon and she was prescribed some reading glasses and he also referred her to ophthalmic surgeon for possible surgery on that right eye that had been injured and uh, had basically blinded her from the age of nine. And it wasn't until May 1984 that she had her appointment with the surgeon who's called Dr. Rogers and he actually told her that he could operate on her right eye, remove up some scar tissue that it had accumulated and not only would this make the eye look better because she was only about 47 at this time but it'll probably restore a significant amount of sight to her eye. So That would be amazing when you've just had one good eye and one eye that hasn't been that good. So after living without the sight in her right eye for nearly 40 years, Marie thought about it for about three weeks and then when she went to her follow-up appointment, she decided that this surgery that Dr. Rogers had recommended was well worth proceeding with for her. And so the surgery was carried out by Dr. Rogers on the 1st of August 1984, but the sight to her right eye was not improved at all. And worse still, she developed inflammation in her left eye. She actually developed a condition called sympathetic ophthalmalia in her left eye, and that was her good eye. And so now she had lost the sight in her left eye as well. And so she was virtually blind. So she sued Dr. Rogers in the Supreme Court of New South Wales for various counts of negligence. And one of her major complaints was that he'd failed to warn her, particularly sympathetic ophthalmia. And she said that had she known about that and that it could have affected her left eye, her good eye, she wouldn't have had the operation. And during the trial, the judge heard evidence that Marie had actually asked Dr. Rogers a lot of questions and they described it as incessantly about any risks of accidental damage to her left eye. And she was really nervous about the operation and she even asked that her left eye be covered up during the operation 
to prevent any risk to it and a bandage was actually put on it just to allay her concerns and I think this is a natural concern that she had it's she'd already lost the sight of her right eye due to a penetrating injury and she was no doubt really worried that surgical equipment might accidentally penetrate her left eye and the trial judge found that Dr Rogers had not been negligent at all Uh, and his work was very skilled and very competent there was no question about how good his surgery was but the trial judge did find that there was one thing that he was negligent in and that was that he'd failed to warn Mrs Whitaker of the risk of developing this condition called sympathetic ophthalmalia. And Dr. Rogers told the court that sympathetic ophthalmalia was not something that came to mind to even mention to her. And generally, when you're thinking of duty of care in relation to medical procedures, there's a principle of law called the Bolam principle, and that's applied. And this principle comes from a case, uh, basically the Bolam case, and it basically states a a doctor's not negligent if he acts in accordance with accepted practice by his peers that are of, you know, reasonable standards of qualifications. So, So there's no, so there's a duty of care to patients and to warn, but the standard of warning is a matter of medical judgment, like the medical peers and medical profession and medical practitioners felt that in this case the peers they wouldn't have warned of the risk of sympathetic ophthalmia and experts even gave evidence in the trial that this condition only occurs one in 14,000 procedures and so in medical terms it's considered pretty remote or rare that it would actually even happen. Mrs. Whitaker, however, argued that this Bolam principle should be directed to the treatment rather than the advice. And this case was concerned about the advice about risks involved in the treatment or the operation. And the judge felt that Marie should have been warned of this risk. And ultimately, he agreed with her and awarded her $800,000 odd dollars in damages. Now, Dr. Rogers felt absolutely terrible about what Mrs. Whitaker had gone through. And there was never any question that it was anything to do with his surgery, his highly skilled surgeon. And it wasn't the treatment of Mrs. Whitaker that was at issue. And it wasn't his skill and level as a surgeon. There was no negligence in the treatment. It was whether he should have warned her. Because if she was warned of this, she may have decided that she wouldn't take this procedure because the risk to her in her circumstances with already one eye being blind may be too great of a risk for her to bear. And so Dr. Rogers appealed against the decision and he appealed to the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court of Appeal, and they dismissed that. But he was actually able to, even though this appeal was dismissed, rather than going up the ladder of the appeals court, he was able to go straight to the High Court of Australia with special leave, or it's just a fancy way of saying he got permission to go to the highest court in Australia to get a decision. And there's nowhere else to go after the High Court in Australia. That's it. Their decision is final. So the High Court actually found that Dr. Rogers had conducted the surgery with all skill and care. And the only real question was whether he'd failed to warn Marie Whitaker that as a result of the surgery, she may develop sympathetic ophthalmalia in her left eye. And this would be particularly devastating due to the lack of vision in her right eye and it could lead to her being completely blind which is ultimately what happened or substantially what happened. So the opinion of the medical profession was that although Mrs Whitaker had asked questions she'd never actually specifically asked about whether there was a risk of the operation to her right eye affecting her left eye but As you will recall, she did ask questions about protecting it and she got that bandage applied to it 
and you could tell that she was very nervous and anxious and cautious about the whole procedure. And the court felt that ultimately there was a real danger in applying this Bolan principle because it means that a patient would need to ask the right question to get the relevant information. And so not only that, the question is also determined by medical professions like what all the peers in the medical profession would do of reasonable skill and qualifications. And they felt that that wasn't the right way of judging it. And so they actually rejected using the Bolan test for medical advice, not for the treatment, but for the advice. And so the appeal was dismissed with costs. That means Mrs. Whitaker got to keep the 800 odd thousand dollars But for Australians, it's really important because it introduced a, because it basically introduced a new area of law, uh, failure to warn in the advice about the particular treatment that people might be undergoing. And so for Australians, that's pretty important. So just like when I went to the hospital the last week, They gave me all sorts of warnings and they have to do this now because of cases like this. Depending on the patient, some things might be more significant or more important than for others. It's a really hard job being a doctor, you know, because there's so many laws that you have to comply with and so many questions that you've got to try and think to ask and what you should do that sometimes they can spend more time doing the admin side of it and that questioning side of it uh, more than they can actually do the treating side of it and it's a really really difficult job I really feel for them and poor Dr Rogers he felt absolutely terrible and he described it as a devastating effect uh to Mrs. Whitaker that what had happened to her uh, to her left eye and he just felt absolutely awful for her but you know it wasn't anything that he did in his operation that's the thing it was because he never warned her that this very remote type of thing could actually happen and for her that would be extremely devastating so even though I feel incredibly sorry for Dr Rogers um, I really do think that the High Court got it right in this case and that there needs to be a sort of duty to warn people about things because on different circumstances uh, it can have a devastating effect. Now, I feel very sorry for Mrs. Whitaker. She'll be back later on in the week after I have a nap. <laughs> and until next time, stay safe and happy colouring.